Good evening. We're about to gather and start. If you need to find a seat, now's a good time because uh, this thing is about to begin as uh, we have some technical problems. Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Brad Howell. I am the Dean of Teaching and Learning at Gordon-Conwell and the new Executive Director of this campus here in Charlotte. I want to welcome you to Gordon-Conwell Charlotte. I'm excited that you're here tonight. Welcome. To we also want to extend our uh, welcome to those of you that are watching online and joining us. And I know we have gatherings in different locations and uh, we're grateful for technology that allows us to have these opportunities. And I'm looking forward to uh, the next few years leading this and uh, hopefully taking us to the next level of having our faculty come alongside our students in digital spaces right up here in Charlotte, setting the pace for digital, ed digital education globally. So I'm excited you're here and excited you're part of our story tonight. I wanna to thank Michelle Littlejohn for working really hard to get things done. Huh? And of course, Jess Erickson, those of you who don't know that so much happens behind the scenes to make this a reality. We had a big technical issue this week, and Jess had been working overtime along with Mike Winson to uh, make sure that we have this available to you digitally so that we can showcase the, uh, the awesome technology we have to share our story with people everywhere. We also want to thank you, the media team that works overtime to pull this off and together. Uh, let me open us up in prayer. Heavenly Father, you're an amazing God. We thank you that your Holy Spirit requires no technology, that you are here among us. You are here among the people all over joining us digitally, as well as in this room. And we're grateful for that. And we thank you for working in our lives. We thank you for Dr. Cooley, for the vision that you gave him and the 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 man that he has been and what he has shared with us, and we look so forward to hearing tonight his story and uh, learning and growing from it. But Lord, more than anything, we lift you up. We want you to be glorified. We thank you for you being the God of our lives, the God that we give ourselves to. We love you a lot. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. As many of you know, Bob Cooley, Robert E. Cooley, started the Robert C. Cooley Center for the Study of Early Christianity in memory and in honor of his son who died in an accident at age 40, 16 years ago. And the center is dedicated to the study of the historical origins of the Christian faith. And we put on lectures, we have various tours, we have web-based resources that we make available to people to help people to understand better the historical origins of the Christian faith. I would like to make a couple of announcements related to upcoming events and activities of the Cooley Center. The first is that we are very, very pleased to be able to announce this evening that we are forming a scholarship for Charlotte students to be named after Bob Cooley. So this will be the Robert E. Cooley. <laughs> it will be for Charlotte students. We will have more information about that in the coming weeks. In the meantime, if anybody is interested in more information about that and is interested in being a part of providing the funding for that scholarship, I'd like to ask you to talk to Michelle Littlejohn, who is sitting right over here. The next thing I'd like to mention is that our big lecture series in January 2020 will be held on the 23rd and 24th, January 23rd and 24th. That is a Thursday and a Friday evening. We will be happy to have with us Dr. Stephen Notley from Nyack University, who is a great archeologist in the Holy Land and has a very interesting new discovery related to Bethsaida that he would like to talk to us about. So you won't want to miss that. That will be January 23rd and 24th. I'd also like to give a preliminary announcement about two upcoming trips. We are planning another trip to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, DC in April. 
and there will be more information about that coming out soon. And we are planning our next guided tour of Israel in October and November of 2020. So there will be more information about both of those trips coming out over the next few weeks and months. So please do make a note of those and we would love to have people join us for either or both of those trips. This evening, we are very privileged to hear from Bob Cooley, Dr. Robert E. Cooley, a man who certainly needs no introduction, but a man who is probably known to different ones of you in the room in very different ways for the very different hats that he wears and has worn. Some of you know Bob as a great seminary president who guided Gordon Conwell for about a decade and a half. I believe it was 1981 to 1996 that he was the president of Gordon Conwell. Some of you know Bob Cooley as a great visionary who read the trends in American education and especially in theological education and announced in the 80s and the 90s where education would be heading in 2019. And as I have said before, all of his prophecies related to education have come true. And it was largely as a result of that prophetic vision that the Charlotte campus of Gordon-Conwell was started in 1992. Some of you know Bob Cooley as a great consultant who has worked tirelessly in his so-called retirement with <laughs> seminaries, with universities, with Christian organizations like the World Evangelical Alliance in order to help them to discern the will of God for their goals and to realize the goals for the ministry that they had been given by the Lord. Some of you know of Bob Cooley as a great mentor who has always been very generous with his time, very willing to talk to young people and not so young people like myself, whom he has been mentoring in scholarship, in professorship, in administration, and in leadership. But before Bob was any of those things, Bob was an archaeologist. And it is our great privilege this evening to hear from Bob as he returns to his roots, returns back to archaeology in the Holy Land, and shares from his experience through his title, Household Archaeology, the subtitle, My Career Lies in Ruins. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming our dear friend. Thank you, Dr. Fairbairn, and good evening, friends. As I look around the room, I see so many familiar faces. I'm tempted to call out your names and introduce you to the whole group, but that would be the whole evening. Thank you so much for coming out. And I'm grateful to the staff here for their accommodations. As I draw near the 90 yard line of life, uh, this chair feels pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first time I've ever given a lecture sitting down, Tony. <laughs> I've always stood up. I like to roam when I speak. So I feel kind of confined. But if I get out of uh, character, uh, just raise your hands and slow me down. <laughs> Scientific biblical archeology span is only 150 years old. Uh, most people don't stop to realize that. And my life covers one half of this period. So I've seen many changes, I've seen many trends, many differences. 
Heinrich Schliemann in 1871, excavating Troy, recognized that the ancient sites were stratified. They represented levels of settlement, building, destruction, building, and destruction. So the concept of stratification became his great contribution to the process. And then in 1890, Sir Flinders Petrie, a great British Egyptologist, excavated a Palestinian site by the name of Tel Al Hesse. In separating the strata of Tel Hesse, Petrie recognized Egyptian materials in certain levels that he recognized the dates on. So you could date the strata. And so thus was born seriation and typology of ceramics. Then after World War I, William Foxwell Albright came along, excavated a number of sites in Palestine, Gibeah, mainly at Tel Beit Mirzim. But Professor Albright, developed two major concepts. One is ceramic typology. Every beginning student in biblical archeology span had to learn thousands of potsherds and to identify them. Furthermore, he introduced uh, the language and the theory of biblical archeology. span at Biblical Archaeology to William Albright and to his colleagues meant that there was a confirmation between the biblical texts and the archaeological materials, thus establishing the trustworthiness of the biblical texts. He based this largely on Schliemann's work of Homer, for Schliemann identified many literary passages of Homer that were identified in the ancient site of Troy. And so Albright was encouraged to identify the biblical texts in that fashion. Well, these theories and methodologies were the foundation of my own training in Palestinian archeology. span So I grew up in the very beginning of thought of biblical archeology. span and then 1946, I'm gonna give you just the, the mile markers. I can't give you my history. <laughs> 1946, I was a freshman in college as a student of architecture. In the classes, we were studying the Parthenon. Some of you have been to the Parthenon often said to be the most perfectly constructed building in the world. But from that building, we learned the principles of stress and strain, of convex and concave, of angle and perception, all from that building. So it became a great model in our architectural theory. But what that really did for me was it excited my interest in ancient monuments, ancient antiquities, and the ancient sites. And so in 1953, I entered Wheaton College as a student in biblical studies and Near Eastern archeology. span Wheaton was one of the only few undergraduate schools that had such a program. And so I entered there and graduated in 55. And then they asked me to stay on and take the graduate fellowship in archaeology. And I began my first laboratory work on Dothan materials as I was pursuing my MA degree in uh, teaching the Bible. Then in 1962, I entered New York University to do doctoral studies. And I chose three fields to study in Near Eastern archaeology, anthropology and new world prehistory. So uh, I was busy uh, in, in, in terms of the archeological scope uh, of my studies. 
1959, I was invited to go to Dothan and Eileen and I decided that we would go and we served for five years as the architect of the excavations at Tel Dothan, which you will see tonight. Then in 1969, I was invited to the AI joint expedition and served as field director to Kirbet Hayan. The word Kirbet in Arabic means village or small settlement. Village of Hayan and the village uh, of Radana. And we'll see some of those tonight. 1979, uh, I was invited by Johns Hopkins University to dig a strata, uh, strata trench at uh, the site of Tel Rataba in the Egyptian Delta. The site had been identified as the biblical python, which is mentioned in Exodus 111. And they wanted to prove that it was occupied during the New Kingdom period. And so I was able to dig and demonstrate that it was occupied during that period. And that brought my actual field digging uh, to an end. Then in 1980, I became the annual professor at the William Albright Institute of Archaeological Research in Jerusalem. And that's a position that uh, my friend Tim held a few years later. And it gave me a chance to work on my uh, Dothan materials and to uh, begin the publishing process of the Western Cemetery of Dothan. In 1973 to 1981 was a period in which I served as the director of the Center for Archaeological Research for Missouri State University in Springfield, Missouri. And uh, there I excavated 106 Indian sites and wrote monographs on these. And I provided uh, the written what's called cultural resource management studies for the US government. And so that was the decade of the 70s, I was using my prehistory study. Now, from academics to administration, in March of 1981, <clears throat> the pro-call process was underway to the presidency of Gordon Conwell Seminary. Uh, Leighton Ford met with me in Jerusalem. He was there with a the group and he was on the search committee. And so he began to talk to me about Gordon Conwell. Uh, I went home. I didn't say much to Eileen. I didn't uh, send my resume. I couldn't imagine leaving my academic career because I was so deep in ruins. <laughs> but in April, they convinced me to come to a board meeting and have an interview. And uh, they voted and uh, consequently, uh, we accepted. And uh, as a result, Eileen was blessed with the improved medical care. She would never have had this in Missouri. Good evening, Marty. <laughs> she was blessed with this medical help, and she lived an additional 41 years as a result of it. And I was blessed, of course, with new challenges in theological education. And uh, some of you know about those. Well, one of the outcomes of that blessing is that I'm here tonight with you and we are in this room. And so, it, <laughs> that's enough on the personal. Let's talk about the professional. Household archeology. span Household archeology span is the study of domestic materials, pottery, silos, cisterns, houses, typical domestic settings, but in the context of community, of community. A household is always defined by community. That's one of the things I want you to grapple with tonight. 
and uh, we're going to consider three sites, Dothan, AI, and Redana. These sites, of course, are on the land bridge that connects the three continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. God directed the Israelites into the land of promise onto this land bridge to be a light to the nations. And the prophet Ezekiel said, have not I set Jerusalem in the midst of the nations? And the purpose for Israel was to be a light to the nations. I know of no better geographical point than that could happen than the little land of Israel. Of course, it was here that Abraham was called along with his family, his household, to the land of promise. He came into that land, and it says, and he lived in the tent between Bethel and Ai. And then he went down into Egypt and returned to Beersheba and to Hebron, where he developed the family tomb and the family is buried. Then we have to consider the land of Canaan. I want you to get the idea that Canaan was caught between Mesopotamia and Egypt. So that when we talk about household archeology, span I'm really talking about Canaanite households and then about Israelite households. If you haven't read the book of Judges in recent days, please do so. Because it tells you about the interaction between these Israelites and the Canaanites that so much of the Israelite practice domestic was borrowed from the Canaanites. And so in my experience, I have worked with both the Canaanite and the Israelite material. And so that's why I want you to understand where Canaan is located. Throughout the Middle East, there are 25,000 buried sites or tells as we call them. Only about 6% of them are excavated so we have a lot of homework to do. <laughs> and so you students, get excited. There's homework for you. There's a lot of discovery to wait that will illuminate the biblical text. Here is a buried site up in the Becca Valley in the shadows of Mount Lebanon, the Lebanon mountain range. It's a beautiful area. Here is Bechon. Some of you who were with me in June saw Bichon. It's a marvelous site. 21 cities on top of each other in this buried site. And in front of it developed the city of Scythopolis. Once the Greeks came, they brought standing armies and they no longer needed to build walls around the cities. So they expanded out beyond the high points of the city. And so we have uh, the belt, uh, Bechon. And I thought you'd just be interested in the, the timeline that we work with in archaeology. And tonight, uh, we're going to work with only the Middle Bronze and the Late Bronze and the Iron One period. Really, the Late Bronze and Iron One period, which is the days of uh, Joshua and Judges and First Samuel. So we'll be looking particularly at that period, but there are implications for the later periods of Israel, as well as for the first century of Roman Palestine. Uh, the first site we'll look at is the site of Tel Dothan. The mound itself is 65 feet high, uh, or meters high. There are 21 cities here. They go all the way back to 4,000 BC to the Chalcolithic period. And they run consistently up to the Islamic period of the 14th century. And so we have found uh, all of those levels of cities. This is an aerial view that gives you a pretty good idea. Uh, if I can point it out, well, we're gonna go back a few. Uh, 
Up here is the Islamic palace, Hellenistic houses. Here you have iron or Israelite houses, Canaanite houses. Over here, you have the Israelite village where we have a great deal of Assyrian material. This is one of the great contributions of Dothan. And uh, there was a lot of Assyrian material here that re reflects the eighth and seventh century of the Old Testament. And then right here's where we're gonna focus our attention on the Western Cemetery uh, where uh, the large tomb was developed in what we call Area K, the Area K Seminary. Cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget I'm an old man. <laughs> As I have dug in these ancient cities, uh, my interest was more than just in the ruins themselves. But what did they tell me? What could I learn from them? And one thing I'm convinced of in all the sites that I worked at is what I call family social solidarity in life and death. Family social solidarity in life and death. Let's take a thought and think about that. I'm going to show you uh, the family tomb that I excavated in uh, 59 to 64. On the western slopes of Dothan, lower down from the Canaanite city, the Canaanite families dug down through the material into the bedrock and developed a uh, shaft about two meters deep with seven steps in it. Then they carved out a large uh, room uh, for their tomb. In the meantime, as a result of an earthquake, the ceiling had broken. And you can see uh, in this particular site right here, in the stratification, you can see how the strata has slipped following the uh, ceiling of the tomb. Uh, that was an early Bronze Age uh, strata, and it was above the late Bronze Age tomb. So here is the uh, bedrock as it looked and broken. And we had to remove all of that before we could get to the tomb. Once we had emptied the tomb, we could look back and see the shaft. Uh, I had to put a wooden door in there. Uh, the, lo <coughs> the local shepherd thought it would be a wonderful sheepfold. <laughs> so I had to keep him out. <laughs> Uh, he was right, but I had to keep him out. And looking back into the tomb, you see the rest of it with the various crypts. It was about 22 feet long, 15 feet wide, and there were eight crypts in it, and it belonged to a single family. You say, how do you know that? Uh, I will show you some of the people I took out of it. 288 bodies. I had all of the teeth examined at the anthropology department at Notre Dame. <coughs> DNA showed that this was a single family. So we were dealing with a family tomb documented by modern science. Uh, this gives you a little layout of it. Uh, the prophets would often speak of these as houses of mourning. As Jeremiah said, you go down into your houses of mourning and you drink from your cups of consolation, yet you do not mourn for the afflictions of Joseph. So these are, are in a sense, uh, houses of mourning where the family living would mourn for those who had died. A look at the stratification. This is what makes this tomb so unusual in the Middle East. There were five levels of occupation in the tomb. This is the first level. They would bring the body in, they would clothe it or cover it with potsherds and surround it with domestic vessels. And then when the flesh decayed, 
the sign was given that they had reached the neither world. No longer was there respect for the skeletal material. And so this process went on time and time again. So the first level of pottery you saw rested on top of some of the residents. They were stretched out in an elongated position. And you could tell that there was no regard for the skeleton once the flesh had decayed. This poor man at the bottom got a giant headache. <laughs> and so consequently, uh, the bones did not mean much. But as Israel borrowed these practices, they developed the uh, ossuaries. Some of you are familiar with that, bone boxes, so that when the flesh was decayed later on, they would gather the bones up out of respect for the dead. But the Canaanite period, there was no regard for the bones. So we removed all the pottery, discovered another level of stone. They had chipped off of the ceiling and laid down a new level for the dead. Keep in mind, this is stratification. The lower you go, the older it gets. So we're getting into the second level and you see you start digging and you have another whole level again. So we have five strata in this tomb that dates from about 1300 down to 1100. It doubles across two archeological periods, late bronze B and iron 1A. Those are archeological dates, but they mean 13 to uh, 1100 BC and serves as a backdrop for understanding uh, during the days of uh, the judges. We uh, excavated this by stringing up a grid so that we could record all of the objects. A few of you have been on archeological digs and you know how important your reference points are. So we have been able to reconstruct this tomb completely because we have an ax, absolute position of every object. And as I removed the objects from the tomb, I was able to give a description. You can't see her, but I had a secretary standing, sitting behind me, and I was dictating everything to her. So we have a huge document uh, of the description as each vessel is eliminated. What I want to emphasize is not only the mortuary practice, but the vessels themselves, because these vessels were not made particularly for the tomb or for mortuary practice. These vessels were brought right out of the homes. And so it gives you a good cross section, a good assemblage of the artifacts in the Canaanite house. Uh, in the crypts, our pottery was not destroyed because it was protected from the falling ceiling. And it gives us a good idea what a typical burial would have. Uh, here you will see some pottery at the head and some at the feet. Here's what's at the head, uh, about eight vessels buried around. There's a variety, there's no duplication here. Uh, they're buried uh, with this deceased person. I'm gonna show you some of these uh, vessels so you can understand uh, the domestic vessels of the Canaanites. Notice on the uh, left, the handle is on the shoulder, is on the shoulder of the jar. And then as you move over to the right, notice how the handle comes up to the rim. <clears throat> This is the typological change that tells me that the first vessel is 1300 and the other vessel is 1100. It's like going out in a parking lot and trying to date all the automobiles. You have style factors that you deal with. This is called a pixis or an ointment vessel. This is a Canaanite copy of a Canaanite or of a Mycenaean or Greek original. The ointment vessel was used to anoint the body. You remember in the New Testament, 
Who was it that wanted to anoint Jesus? You see, the practice continues right on. And so the Canaanites duplicated the imports. Here's the import. You can see how much better it is. The Mycenaean were. There was tremendous commerce in the Eastern Mediterranean during this period. And it shows up in the tomb. Now, for some of you, you'll enjoy this vessel. This is not a teapot. <laughs> this is a beer strainer <laughs> to strain the husk out of the beer. This is a Philistine contribution to the country, <laughs> or at least from the Mediterranean. These are chalices. The first one is modeled after a palm tree. A palm tree was a symbol of fertility in the Canaanite iconography. And so they made the incense burner uh, in the shape of a, of a palm tree. We're down to level three. I'm going rather fast. Uh, I found 3,400 objects. <laughs> So I would take a whole month to tell you about each one. But I did want you to see the Canaanite wine jar, that very large jar in the uh, left-hand side. And the Canaanite jar uh, was used in the wine commerce from the Canaanites. They shipped them to Egypt and up to the Greek Mycenaean area. That's why there's a very heavy base and so the, the vessel could stand straight up on shipboard. And by tightening the shoulders together, they could ship uh, these rather odd shaped vessels uh, in the wine trade. Uh, you'll be interested in this. This is a, a little vessel from the island of Cyprus. Uh, if you turn it upside down, uh, it's like a poppy plant. It's the head of a poppy. And this was known for the drug traffic <laughs> that was moving from Cyprus all along the coast. The Arabs call this vessel a bilbil because when you, an Arab drinks from a jug, he goes glug glug, glug glug, or bilbil. And so they call it a bilbil. Here's a collection of uh, Grecian ware, again, for trade, Mycenaean. You see that in the burial practice, the family not only put ordinary common domestic ware, but the import ware, some of the valuable ware, was placed alongside uh, of the deceased. So you here you have a piriform vase, you have a, uh, what we call a stirrup cup, that was for perfume, and then a flask in the front. This is from the island of Cyprus. Uh, this is a Cypriot milk bowl. Uh, has a wishbone handle on it. It's a very thin pottery, valued and import from the island of Cyprus. And lamps. Uh, I found 640 lamps in the tomb. You see, light played a tremendous role in the journey to the netherworld. And so when the family would come to the tomb, they would have plenty of lamps to bring light into the tomb. The one on the left is quite unusual. It has seven nozzles. It's in the same period in which the sevenfold lamp concept was found in the tabernacle. It's generally considered to be a part of the Canaanite ritual vessels in their worship of Baal and Ashtaroth. The single nozzle lamps on the right are in the beginning of the early uh, Iron Age or Iron One. And uh, one of these here is on the table up at the front. So if you have time, uh, take a look at uh, the lamp, 3000 years of history of the lamp, and you'll uh, be amazed at the lamp as it was used throughout the biblical period. Thy word is a lamp under my feet and a light to my path. Or you remember the 10 virgins. 
The five wise had their juggler with them. The five foolish begged since they didn't have theirs. You'll see all of that here on the table, illustrated. <clears throat> on the right is a lamp that uh, some of you saw in the Israel Museum. Uh, this is the only time a lamp with a figurine on it has been found uh, in Israel. And uh, this is by consensus of many who have looked at it, the God of light of the Canaanites. And uh, give you a close up, you who are interested in ceramics can see how they made the face on the end of the nozzle. And then on the bottom of it is the full figure of the, of the person or of the deity that's represented here. Uh, this lamp uh, has quite a bit of discussion about it in the Israel Museum as it relates to understanding uh, the Canaanite system of gods. Uh, this is just a cross section <laughs> of drawing to show you what it looked like. In addition to all of the clay or ceramic material, we have a lot of bronze material. This usually is a symbol of wealth in the Canaanite period. And we found some 40 beautiful bronze bowls uh, in the tomb, along with weapons and tools, swords, uh, uh, daggers, knives, arrowheads, and so on. So they not only buried domestic pottery, but they buried their weapons and their tools. Some would even insist that uh, they buried with the deceased materials that belonged to them. In other words, if a man died and he owned a sword or a, a dagger, they buried it. And uh, some have disputed that, but it, let me go back and show you the jewelry that we found a tremendous amount of jewelry. Uh, we had 28 scarab rings, which reflect a, an Egyptian relationship. Uh, here are some golden earrings. And here you see necklace of the local stones, bracelets. So there's quite a bit of jewelry. If it gives you quite a bit of interest in the, in the female, they were all on the female population. All right, uh, a few observations and I must move along. Uh, just outside of the uh, retaining wall of the shaft leading into the tomb, I found two very large storage jars. Here you see one, and then if you look rather close, you'll see a second one down here. The dipper jug goes with this one. And uh, at the base of the other one, there was another dipper jug. So it's very clear that this was an insulation for pouring water because right above it in the tomb was a hole to pour water down into the tomb. Now, I believe uh, if you go back to the Mesopotamian culture, uh, the first son was often called the poor, the poor. In other words, it was expected that a father would have a son to pour water upon their death. I think that's why Abraham was so concerned about a son as he traveled by Damascus. He adopted Eliezer. He couldn't wait to have his own son because he had to have a poor the poor for him. Anyway, you can see the hole inside of the chamber and uh, down below uh, into the crypts. And this would ensure the deceased uh, water on the way to the nether world. Another way that that could be granted was through a flask. If you look uh, close, you'll see a very large flask. You could put a flask of water with the deceased. Uh, this is at the bottom uh, of the skeleton. There were five vessels and a cl <coughs> clam or shellfish. You notice between the knees, uh, the skull is resting there. 
during my PhD exam, I had a professor who insisted that this was a sign of a Gentile. He insisted that Gentiles were always beheaded and their head put between their knees. And uh, so be it. I wasn't tested on it. <laughs> Here are some pilgrim's flask, uh, different size. The one in the middle comes from Mycenae, again, from Greece. And I'm sure the one on the lower right wouldn't take you very far to the neither world. <laughs> would be rather small. Across level one, we found a number of craters. In fact, 44 of them. These are known as the Cup of Consolation. When the family would come here to mourn, they would have wine and bread the wine in the crater and the family we each hold onto the crater is a symbol that death did not destroy the family. Social solidarity. Jeremiah speaks about the cup of consolation. Now, some of you are going to get agitated with me. But I believe when Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, he was celebrating the mortuary phenomenon before his death rather than afterwards. He was drinking for the cup of consolation. He said, I will not sit with you again until I'm in the kingdom. In other words, until the family is together again, I will not sit with you. Yes, it was at the time of the Passover, but the model Seder of the Passover was not developed till the second century AD. You do not have four cups as you do in the Passover celebration. So I have a bias that Jesus was practicing the mortuary morning cup of consolation. Here's another one, a little bit more grandiose. Uh, on the bottom, uh, you have duplicate in clay, uh, a bronze stand on which the vessel would sit. And so uh, the fenetrated stand uh, marks this as unique. Uh, on many of the vessels were Canaanite iconography. In this case, the Canaanite is uh, pollinating the palm tree. The palm tree is a symbol of fertility. And so the Canaanite has that depicted on the side of this vessel. Here's a zoomorphic, a ritual vessel. Remember the Canaanite celebrated the fertility of the family, of the field, and of the flock. And so they used appropriate ritual vessels to do that. All five of the zoomorphics that we found had the sexual attributes built into them. We have no doubt that they represent uh, Baal in this uh, particular uh, ritual. Here's the Kernis ring. Again, this was a ritual vessel used to have a ceremony in the development of the field. They would pour the wine in and out as a symbol of life into the field with the kernis ring. And so uh, as another ritual vessel, uh, it adds to the meaning uh, of the mortuary practice. Uh, I found a lot of food in the, in the tomb. It seems like whenever food or families get together, no matter where they are, they have food and conversation. They had food in the tomb. And here's the lamb shanks in one vessel. The other vessel is a killed object. You see a sword is bent. 
so as the person has died, so that their sword or their uh, dagger must be killed, and it's called a killed object. So the Dothan Western Cemetery opens up uh, a significant discussion of life and death in the Canaanite family at social solidarity. So that the Canaanite family, once born, once active, was always in existence. Even though members died, they were celebrated in that process. So bones of the earlier burials were unceremoniously swept aside. I'll go fast through this. Body placed in the clear area, either in extended or full length position. Body was clothed or covered with large pottery shirts. And then you have the typical domestic vessels around the body and food and drink was included. And the large number of lamps suggest the importance of lights. Following interment, uh, the chamber doorway was blocked and uh, the shaft was filled. And when a second death in the family took place, they opened up the shaft, placed the body inside. So this practice of multiple successive burials was the common trait of the late Bronze Age uh, Canaanites. So we call, call this a chamber burial. And the reason I put this in is that we understand this style really comes from Cyprus. It's really an influence from the Cyprus tombs. And so the international trade, this was a period of internationalism. And so it reflects itself even in a tomb design. Uh, as I mentioned, that treatment of the body indicates uh, a temporary residence. It was a way station on the way to the neither world. Burial deposits uh, were given, but not renewed. And the material evidence uh, is supported by the liber literary descriptions. And I should mention, uh, the literary is the Ugaritic material from the site of Rashama in northern Syria. So I was able to combine the Ugaritic material with the archaeological material. And there's a coincidence between the literary descriptions. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we read about the Marshak, which is associated with the cult of the dead. And some think that the funerary banquet that uh, is referred is uh, illustrated in this. So that this convergence of literary texts, as I mentioned, and the archeological evidence <laughs> represented three phases. There was the deposit phase or the disposition of the body. Then the second phase was mourning or transition. And the third phase was reincorporation into the neither world. <laughs> The living family went through the same transition. They separated themselves from society. They mourned for a number of days and they reincorporated. Once they determined that the deceased had reached the new, new world, they would go to the Canaanite temple and there they would celebrate. Now, as I come toward the end, toward the Israelite material, we have to go by Jericho on our way up to Ai. This is the valley that Joshua sent his troops up to Ai. And you remember they, they uh, were driven from Ai because of the sin of Achan, who had stolen from Jericho. On the next trip, Joshua put some troops behind the site of Ai and uh, was able to uh, win the site. Uh, I mentioned uh, the map because I want you to get in mind that the green area represents the central highlands. This is the area where we find all of the Iron One Hebrew material. No Canaanite, but all Hebrew material. We have 322 villages found in this area. So after AI or Jericho, which is here. Then we come up to AI and to Redon. So we're going to look at uh, some of the Hebrew material. 
this is an aerial view of AI, or ETEL, as it's called. You will see down in the lower corner here, we found the whole gate system. The wall of the city comes way up here, and up here on top is where we found the Hebrew city. In laying out our grid, uh, we began to find uh, the construction from the Hebrew period. The earlier period was early bronze, so there is no middle bronze or late bronze. In fact, one of the interesting things is none of the Iron One Hebrew villages has yet to date been found on top of a Canaanite site, on top of a late Bronze Age site. And that's true here uh, at AI. Now, this is a Hebrew house called the Pillar House. You're going to see several of these. I think what you're dealing with here are Hebrews who come out of the wilderness living in tents, and they duplicate the tent by having stone pillars and building their stone walls around it. And the chipping of the stone, I found interesting because I found the chisel that matched the chisel marks uh, on the stone. So uh, we know that they cut this out of the bedrock, which is a what's called a Sononian chalk, and it was easy to cut. Here's the main room of the house. Uh, you're going to love this. Uh, the stones on either side, the flat stones, those are the sofas. <laughs> Some of you who have visited Arab homes, you go in and they've got chairs on both sides of the room. They still carry it on. And that's the cocktail table in the middle. <laughs> Two and a half meters high, I found a aperture for the beams that went across on the pillars. And so there was no doubt that the roof was supported by beams on the pillars. Then I began to dig into the clay carpet in the room. And lo and behold, I found charged olive stones. The lady of the house literally swept the dirt under the rug. <laughs> I also found a ring. So they lost a ring and it got lost in the floor somewhere. <laughs> These are typical household activities and you'll find them. So this gives you an idea of a compound. Uh, these are uh, pillared houses. And then you have a courtyard and then little rooms here. The little rooms there are for the animals, for the fattening of the calf. Remember the story of the prodigal. When the servant was said to go fetch the fatted calf so we can celebrate. He didn't have to go out to the back 40. He could just go to the courtyard. You're gonna see this in, in several other places. Well, this is the drawing of the pillared houses. Uh, we won't linger with that, but now we're gonna go to the last site. Uh, about five kilometers to the west is the site uh, of Rodana. You will see from AI where we were, passing Bethel over to Rodana. We're in that green part of the hill country again. This is uh, the hilltop on which the village of Rodana was built. It's right on the edge of modern Ramallah. Uh, you can see some of the modern homes begin to encroaching up on top of the mountain. But what's important in this case is to see along this line, a road that was cut through to the top by the Jordanian artillery. This is the best overlooked site that looks down on the plain uh, of the Mediterranean coast of Israel. And the artillery of the Jordan army was located here during the war of 67. And I came in 69. They had cut through or bulldozed through the village site and put their artillery on the edge of the mountain 
to shoot out over the, the valley. But in so doing, they destroyed the site or one edge of it. But on the same time, it led to its discovery. And so here I'm standing by one of the pillars. I knew exactly what we had here from the AI dig, a pillared house, but it had been destroyed. So in 1969, we began to excavate it. <clears throat> Along the edge that had been disrupted uh, by the Jordanians, I could see that we were dealing with two, two levels. You notice this level of clay floor. Then underneath it is another level, and this is a Iron Age cooking pot that has been broken in it. So there were two levels of occupation that I could see right from the start of the dig. This is what it looked like after I dug uh, several days and to get a better view of the house. And what I want you to see here out towards the top of this picture, you see the pillar. And the pillar house was here. The main family would live there. But as the sons would marry, they would build three room apartments. Three room apartments were added to the pillar house so that the household was a result of extended living conditions. And the pillar house would be the parents' living accommodations. You remember what Jesus said in John 13? In my father's house, there are many rooms. When you're a member of God's family, he's got a room for you. I love it. The typical Hebrew pillared house. Four or five pillars down through the middle, two or three rooms at the back. Let's look at some of the material from Rodana. Keep in mind, this dates about 1200 to 1100 BC, the days of the judges. The tribe of Benjamin in this area. Here's a, a room with uh, the large storage vessels that have been broken on it. I removed those in the floor and I found a large vessel dug down into uh, the bedrock. Keep in mind that the site has two levels and you see it here. One level broken pottery, second level a vessel buried into the bedrock for the storage of either food or water. Here is one I put together to give you an idea of what the storage vessel would look like. Uh, this is what the archaeologist calls a color rim jaw, a color rim jaw. We are building up attributes of Hebrew villages, pillared houses, color rim jars are two of the attributes. On this one, we have some writing. Uh, there was quite a stir once we found this inscription, because if you look close, you see an ox head, a ladder, and an L at the bottom, A, H, and L. So this is the proto kidonitic script of the Hebrew alphabet. And so, uh, Frank Cross at Harvard had quite a time uh, working with this as he argued that uh, they brought this in with them uh, from the desert and adopted uh, the Canaanite script. And this is the beginning of the Hebrew alphabet. Along the edge of the road, we continue to dig. What I want you to see here is right here. Here we found an altar in a home with ritual wear associated with it. You can't help but reading the book of Judges and reading it time and time again, how they had their altars to Baal and Ashtaroth in their homes. They did not follow in the obedience of God's ordinances or the covenant. 
But so we can pretty well document uh, this. Here's a ritual vessel, a multi-handle. And uh, notice that there are, are two bull mouths, or you see them here. They look like bass, Joe, ready to catch a, a plug. <laughs> yeah, but uh, they're actually the, the bull. And this is for making decisions. Uh, here I've drawn uh, to show the circumvention between the two heads. And the vessel ritually was manipulated so that the liquid would come out of the yes mouth or the no mouth. Dear Lord, dear Baal, are you going to rain today? Should I plant? Yes or no? Uh, this was the ritual in the house. Along with the village, uh, they terraced the hillside. Up to now, the Canaanites lived in the valleys on the plains. But the Hebrews developed a hill country and built terraces for their crops. On one of the terraces, I found what is called a saddle crumb. This is a big stone of basalt. And on top of it would be a, a smaller basalt stone the size of a loaf of rye bread. It would take two women to grind, one to push the upper stone and the other to pour the grain and take the ground off of the saddle crumb. And you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24, two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be left and the other shall be taken. See, it's an observation right out of daily life. Out back at the road again, we found a number of storage pits. Uh, these pits were filled with uh, pottery and uh, they evidently served like a pantry or <coughs> what have you in the house. And then we found 1,100 sling stones. If you walk down into the valleys, they're called wadis, you will pick up these kind of stones. Flint nodules are pushed by the water and they are rounded out. So when David picked up five smooth stones, Tim, he had the size of a tangerine or the size of an orange. That would do a good job on Goliath. <laughs> we found 1,100 of them in the first level of Urdana. What does that mean? Well, personally, I think it means evidence of the Civil War recorded in the Book of Judges. It says there were 700 left-handed swingers in Benjamin. So this could be evidence of the Civil War mentioned in Judges. Here's another rock pile. There were five rock piles. This one here was the best of the pillared houses. You could see the other rock pile in the back. I left that for one of Tim's students to excavate 100 years from now, <laughs> when new methods come along. But there's the, the pillared house. And notice that along the edge, you have a bench. You remember the stones up at AI in the room where they would sit? Here, they just build it into the bedrock. At the cisterns between the pillars, they would run the rainwater off of the roof, down into the cisterns. This was quite unique. The Canaanites could not, uh, had not identified this technique yet, but the Hebrews saved water through this cistern drainage system off of the flat roofs. And we'll see that in a moment. Here is the pillared house from the back, and you see the room across. Give you a good idea. It's not only the best constructed, but it gives you an idea of the nearby pillared house, a courtyard in between. That probably was a rather large uh, extended family compound. In that pillared house, we found this, uh, what looks like a chocolate drop. It's diorite stone, and it has a seal on the bottom of it. Uh, he was probably the elder of the village. We'd call him the mayor or the secretary or 
uh, someone in charge of the family, and this was probably the seal of Radana. We found quite a bit of iron material. This was unusual. And uh, we find the iron knife, uh, the spear point, and we found the kiln in which uh, the tools were made. Here we have the ash, and uh, I found the, newer, the uh, uh, clay nozzle that would go to the billows, and, and a whole series of metallurgical tools around this particular burial. These are spindle whirls that the women uh, had a small stick that would go through for spinning uh, the wool into thread. And this would tighten up the threads and they would make their wool thread this way. As I've already mentioned, uh, the hill in the back I've left for Tim's students. Now, I, I want you to study a Palestinian home. One thing I found very attractive over the years is comparing the Iron One Hebrew villages with contemporary Palestinian village life. Their family and their homesteads are identical. And if you visited an Arab home, they never finish them. They always have steel rods, Tim, leading up so they can put another floor on when they have another family. And they keep building straight up with different levels. And so when you look here, this is not much different than what we found at Redona. Houses, courtyards, and even in the, in the courtyard, you have an oven an oven right here for the baking of bread. So I reconstructed a village to get an idea of what it's like. These pillared houses were two-story. You could see the rafters that have extended through the walls and all of the activity in the courtyard the grinding of grain, the making of meals, caring for animals, the vineyards. This is a typical Hebrew village. So when you read the book of Judges, keep this in mind. This will help you to understand it better. Here I've reconstructed a pillared house. You will notice in the house, the animals on the one side of the pillars. Down below is where the domestic activity of food is cared for, and then work and sleep on the second floor. The man rolling the rooftop. The roof was made out of sticks and clay, and after every rain, that had to be rolled out. We often find the rollers, and I should have showed you a picture of one. We find the rollers fallen down through as a result of the destruction. So after every rain, the roof had to be rolled. Then along the terrace of the hillsides would be the threshing floor. Of course, the stories of Gideon come to life here. When you think we're in that time period and they are threshing the floor. So what's the summary? When we look at the uh, Hebrew households from the 13th to the 12th century, we have these small hilltop villages. Now remember, 322 have been excavated to date. So it's not just Redon or Ai. It covers the whole hill country. And they have no defensive walls. They're not uh, built for security. And then you have, uh, Arable land, uh, that is, they terraced the hillsides and they had springs nearby. They located in, the, in what we call the highlands or the central hill country from Galilee to the Negev. None were found on, this is interesting, none were found on late Bronze Age sites or Canaanite sites. And the 322 villages, so now, uh, 
population estimates at about 100. Uh, that could constitute a debate if we want to discuss it sometime. Mm -hmm. um, the houses are clustered into compounds, two to four houses, and they share common walls and courtyards. And their pillars are work monoliths. And the houses are divided in two or five rooms and the plaster cisterns. That's a typical house of the Hebrews of this period. They have storage pits or silos as we call them for their grain storage. But the interesting thing, in none of these villages have they ever found any monumental buildings. There are no central administrative buildings. There are no village halls. It's all domestic, it's all household. So, it isn't until we get later on that we pick up statehood. Now, the pottery, as you can see, consists of just everyday domestic pottery. The iron implements are interesting because we read in Samuel how submissive the Hebrews were to the Philistines for the handling of iron. And yet in these villages, we find the capacity to at least make their iron weapons, even though they may have taken them for sharpening uh, to the Philistines. Uh, we have limited evidence of ritual and uh, inscriptional wear. At the food systems, uh, we know are pretty much agrarian farm products. And the absence of pig bones is very important because <laughs> we find plenty of sheep and cattle bones, but no pig bones. And so again, that's a further identifier of a Hebrew site. Now, uh, Lawrence Steger, was he one of your professors? Lawrence Steger was one of Tim's professors. He developed a system built around these hilltop houses. An individual development or the individual dwelling, he called the house of the father. The house of the father, Beit Ab. A cluster of dwellings, if you take two or three of the dwellings, he called them the multi-generational extended family. The village community, he called a clan or a tribe. And the complex of villages were the sons of Israel. But there was no centralized government, no centralized religious system as such. And so consequently, this helps us to understand the culture of the households of the early Hebrew period. Now, as I work toward the end, I know it's getting late, but I'm driving as fast as I can put my foot to the pedal. <laughs> uh, the life that you read in the Judges and Samuel are, is reality in the light of what we have found here. That's why I urge you to go home and read those books and they'll come alive to you. These hill country sites were surrounded by the other people that the Israelites failed to annihilate in entering into the land. So you have the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they were all in the land and a part of the social map. And so we are told in the end of Judges that in those days there was no king in Israel, no king. Now, What's the conclusion? Well, I'll cut it short. In the book of Joshua and Judges in 1 Samuel, we have the household culture that I've showed you in the midst of community. Households were not isolated. They were a part of the community. As we get to the ninth and sixth centuries, we come to the time of the kingdom. David, Saul, Solomon, and the other 19 kings that rule Israel and Judah. Here we have a state versus the village culture that I've showed to you. Then when we get down to the end, of course, uh, we have the captivity period. What I just want to mention is the architecture of these houses continues through the Old Testament 
into the New Testament. Here is the, the village of Capernaum from Jesus' day. Here you see the pillared houses and the courtyards. The same kind of construction continues right on. Here's the recent excavation at Nazareth. They're just beginning to find uh, the stone houses from the time of Jesus, but I can pretty well predict from what I see here, they're gonna find households very much like the Highland pillared houses that we found. This is the Roman house that eventually became the house church. You remember in the Acts and the epistles, there were those of wealth who were converted, invited, if you deem me faithful to the Lord, come to my house. And so the community would come together in a Roman house. Uh, Roman houses have been found particularly in Pompeii that help us to understand how the Roman wealth expanded houses around courtyards because the household in the Roman period, New Testament period, was different than in the Old Testament period. The Roman household was made up of the father and the mother and the children, the nuclear family. It was made up of the extended family, uncles and aunts and so on. It was made up of servants. These were employees that worked for the family. They were made up of slaves who serviced the family. And they were made up of clientele, customers of the family. So when you talk to a Roman household head or pater familias as he was called, it would be someone who had a house like this. You can see why the Roman house, household, developed into the house church of the second century, third century, <coughs> before the Constantinian designs came along in the fourth century. So the household in the Roman period served as a format. Now, what are the implications? I guarantee you this is the end. <laughs> I'm always reminded in Genesis one to two, that the family was God's intention in creation. It was not good for man to live alone. He was given a wife. They were to go forward and to be productive. And we get to Genesis four, we find that family members were to relate to each other, but poor Cain wanted to know if he was really his brother's keeper. And then, the communal sense of people and family is the dominant theme in the biblical households, which is quite different from Western society where the individual is emphasized. That's why you who travel or work in the Middle East have to deal with the families of Middle Eastern peoples because the family takes on meaning in the context of community, not so in the West. In Genesis 6, we read that Noah and his family, household, it says, was saved from the flood. Then again, in Genesis 12, God establishes his call with Abraham and it says, and Abram and his household came to the land of Canaan. God's covenant was given to community, to a household, not to an individual. And so the family becomes an important provision in the Mosaic legislation. So that even uh, in the Ten Commandments, Honor your father and your mother. Respect them. They're the head of the household. And throughout the laws, there are laws that govern the family relationship. And so Jesus speaks of the sanctity of marriage 
And at the same time, he talks about being against the frivolous divorce in Matthew 19. During Paul's second journey, if you remember in Acts 16, uh, two households were baptized, the household of Lydia and the household of the Philippian jailer. And so the head of the Roman household believed, was converted, and the whole family was baptized. So we could have quite a debate on that. But uh, clearly God's desire is to save isolated, isn't to save isolated villages, individuals, but entire households. So Jesus makes clear this theological point that the kingdom of heaven is most important family connection is spiritual, not physical. You remember the Pharisees came up to Jesus, said, here's your mother and your brothers. Jesus said, they're not my mother and my brothers. These, these disciples, they're my mother and my brother. Relationship to God's household is not based around a biological or physical relationship. It's built around a spiritual relationship. And Jesus was emphasizing that. Of course, John builds on that when he talks about being born again. He says it's not a natural birth in the first chapter. It's a spiritual birth. And then Paul builds on that when he says uh, that you are the adopted sons of God. And I think, at least the way I look at it, the defining characteristic of the spiritual family is love one another. Love one another. As he says in John 13, a new command I give you, love on one another. I left the E out. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Consequently. You are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. So as I look around tonight, we represent the household of God. I love you. God bless you. We've got a, a few moments for questions, and the only thing that we ask is if you have a question, please come to the mic in the center of the room so everyone can hear your questions. To some, I may be a foreigner and a stranger, but I am a brother in Christ. I have a question. My question would be, towards the end of the lecture, you said there was no community buildings in the house size villages for the Hebrews. So my question would be, in terms of worship, is the worship ever without outside of the household as a community, or at that time was it always just in the household? Did somebody interpret? I didn't quite hear it. What was the last part of the question? Sure, I'll repeat the question. So towards the, the end of the your sermon, sorry, your talk, you said that on the hillside communities of the Hebrews, there was no communal buildings, there's no community buildings. So as such, in terms of worship, the, the Hebrews at that time, did they worship solely within the family or did they have community worship at that period of their existence? That's a good question. They were supposed to go to Shiloh, to the tabernacle yes. for centralized worship. Yes. 
but instead uh, the power of Baal and the asteroid and the Canaanite gods attracted them. And so in their disobedience to the covenant, they yielded to that attraction. And so Shiloh, Shiloh was shunned to a large extent in the, in the sense of community. And so if you read the book of Judges again, yes. you're going to feel that tension mm -hmm. going on. Yes. Does that help? No. <laughs> <laughs> I understand what you said, but in that tension, there is also a need for worship with the Most High. And I feel that in your response, I wonder we need God on a daily basis. Every day we should be worshiping him. And I feel that true believers of the Most High want to worship on a daily basis. As such, I don't feel that people at that time would be traveling great distances to make that happen. So as such, I've, I would think that within their community leaders or within the leaders of their family, they would worship together. Yeah, to the one. Sir, I don't know if I've captured everything you said. Jim, did you hear what he said? Yeah, yeah it was, he was wondering just how much worship was really centralized <coughs> at home and not just at the tabernacle. If you yeah. read in Judges again, uh, probably the major part of the household worship was in the home and not at Shiloh. And this, this was the tension in the book. You read it all the way through mm -hmm. between the Israelites worshiping Baal and God as over against keeping the covenant with God. Yes. And so I would have to surmise that that worship was in the home because we find the ritual and the altars in the home. Right. Indeed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. I'm sorry, my hearing is not the best. My speaking could be better. <laughs> Thank you. My question is this. You have concluded these are um, Hebrew communities. Do the Arabs in the Arab area today accept those conclusions, those judgments, those, those were actually evidence of um, Hebrews living there for hundreds and hundreds of years? Help. Yeah, you, you talked about the earmarks of Jewish settlements or he, ancient Hebrew settlements. Do Arabs in the area recognize those as Hebrew? Yes. Uh, simply because they're under the management of the Israeli Antiquities Authority, <laughs> <laughs> which means that they're an archaeological site and that they uh, recognize uh, the Hebrew origins of those villages. But their argument is that uh, their ancestry goes back to the Canaanites. They so, precede the Hebrews. Ah, okay. Hello, Dr. Cooley. Abby Benet here. Was in the first class here in Charlotte. Thank you very much. God brought it here just for me, <laughs> and he used you and Jenny and some others, but I want to tell you, um, I guess it's not a question. It, it's kind of a question. My husband and I now teach in Africa. We train pastors who cannot get to biblical education, and I'm so excited about all the online opportunities, but what you've, sorry, what you've helped me with tonight, and I'll speak loudly because I wear hearing aids and I get it. <laughs> African community and households and family is clan and tribe. And for 12 years, we've had a son there who's visited the United States four times and teaches with us, directs us. We work with indigenous leaders there only. And you're helping me. I teach on the family as a chaplain in pastoral care courses are my, my area. 
And the family is so much closer to the biblical picture there in some ways. I'm not saying in every way. You know, sometimes they kill the bride if she doesn't do the right thing in the Bunda tribe. But <laughs> but you're just helping me with my teaching because it's so evident through the archaeology. And I've been to Israel, not with you, but with Dr. Jim. <laughs> but it's amazing how it makes it more clear about the family and the emphasis on the extended family. And it's both a blessing and a curse, but some of it is more biblical than our Western individualized ways. So thank you. I think you brought out two very important points that we all have to deal with. One is the demise of the nuclear family in American life. 70% of the American population, or 17% of the American population represents only the nuclear family. Stop and think about that. 17%. The other part that we educators have to deal with is the increasing multiplication of digital technology. Even our public educators are dealing with that. What is that doing to our young people and their capacity to learn? Uh, how are we gonna handle it at the graduate school level? We don't have a faculty trained in it. Faculties are trained for the classroom, for an interaction. But how do we do it with technology? Uh, that's one thing I could say about the Charlotte campus. They've done magnificent in stepping out with Digital Live and some of the things they have done with communication. But they got a long ways to go. So how, how do we get to this in terms of using technology and teaching and learning so that we can have transformation as you spoke about. That's the frontier that I think our faculties have to deal with. I think that's uh, about enough for our questions and we appreciate you coming out this evening. Uh, just a word before we leave, uh, check out the Cooley website, look under the uh, engage button on the website um, and check uh, Center for Early uh, Christianity. And there's all kinds of resources, bibliographies, web links, uh, articles, previous lecture series. And of course, we'll have information on the upcoming trips as well. So I encourage you to uh, check out that website. Uh, let's close our time together with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this opportunity to sit under the teaching of Dr. Cooley hear about his history and to hear about history itself and your history and the history of your people. Now, we've been educated tonight and we are grateful for that opportunity. We're thankful for Dr. Cooley and his many years of service, not just to the seminary, but to your kingdom. And we're grateful for his ministry uh, to us here this evening. Bless him in the days to come. Uh, bless the seminary uh, and its work. As he says, we have a lot to do in terms of new modes of education, so help us uh, so that we can fulfill the work of your kingdom to the fullest possible extent. Go with us this evening. Give us traveling mercies. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.